Thursday morning. Now, for years, the science, technology, engineering and maths, or STEM subjects as they're known, have been dominated traditionally by men. We've seen a lot of progress on that issue recently, with women at the forefront, of course, of designing many of the vaccines developed in the fight against COVID. But even now, only one in four STEM graduates are women. So what's being done to change that? And what are the challenges along the way? Let's talk first about this to Dr Claire Taylor, who's a senior lecturer in medical microbiology in the School of Applied Sciences at Edinburgh Napier University. Claire, thank you so much for your time this morning. Hi there. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's lovely to join you. What is preventing more young women, do you think, at the moment, choosing these STEM subjects, Claire? Oh, do you know, I wish I actually had the answer to that question. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a source of frustration because um, I think there's many assumptions made about young women and what they want to do. Um, and actually, if you speak, speak to younger, younger people, Many, many young women are, and children are, are really interested in science and STEM subjects. Um, and there's something seems to happen um, for certain subjects, not all, all of the STEM subjects, but something seems to happen, um, which means that fewer women are choosing subjects like physics, engineering and computing. Um, and, and it's not because they're not capable. But there's something um, which is making these subjects seem slightly less appealing to them. So we, we really need to understand what that is. Yeah, it's part of the problem, Claire, that it's been so male-dominated, it seems like a mountain to climb for many young women. It, it, it certainly can. And, and I guess one of the, the things is that if you're a young woman and you're trying to visualise yourself um, studying a subject... Um, at, at school, at, at, at uh, A-level, hires, or, or where, wherever you are, um, you know, you look at the class and think, well, am I going to fit into that class? And it's the same at university level. Um, you know, people are thinking, how's it going to be for me in that class? So if, if people don't see themselves represented in something, then I guess they're less likely to choose it because they'll think it's not for them. Now, one of the ways you're trying to change this, Claire, is with this new initiative, Soapbox Science. Tell us, tell us what you do. How does this work? Ah, well, Soapbox Science has actually been running for a few years now. And uh, um, it is basically what it sounds like. It's science on a soapbox. So we, we've, we've um, held Soapbox Science in Edinburgh. I've had a pause during the pandemic. But the event is basically um, 12 women on a soapbox in the middle of, of Edinburgh. And over the course of um, three hours, four women will be on a soapbox at a time. Um, they're in the middle of a, of a public space to talk about their research in the different STEM fields uh, with passers-by, um, members of the public and, and people that have come out especially to, to kind of hear from them. So it uh, happens up and down the UK, um, and there's a number of different events this year across the UK. And in fact, soapbox science has become such a popular thing. It's expanded outside of the UK and now has a global uh, following and events happening right across the world. And this is about breaking down barriers and just getting rid of any obstacles that young women might see as being in the way to them being the ones standing on that soapbox in 10 years' time. Well, what, what, what it's aiming to do is show the diversity of different women and the, the range of different um, STEM research that's taking place. So, you know, we hope that people come along, young girls... And, and young boys, obviously, and their, their parents, families, carers. And people could look at the women on, the, on these soapboxes, hear what they're talking about, be inspired by it, and, and hopefully visualise themselves um, doing something similar in the future. I mean, we, we, we kind of demonstrate that they're, that they're all scientists because they wear a white lab coat um, standing on the soapbox. Um, so it's quite a sight to see. 
Clear. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Apologies for the quality of the line there. Dr. Claire Taylor, Senior Lecturer in Medical Microbiology at Edinburgh Napier University. Let's speak next to Anya O'Brien. Now, Anya is a planetary science PhD student at the University of Glasgow and joins me on the line this morning. Anya, morning. Thanks for your time this morning. Good morning, good morning. Um, planetary science PhD student. Wow, that sounds clever. Tell us what you do. Yeah, so I am studying rocks from Mars um, at the University of Glasgow to try and understand if Mars has the right ingredients for life. So just your average kind of day-to-day -day thing, really. <laughs> yeah, I can't think of anything more exciting than that, to be honest, for any kid <laughs> that was brought up on science fiction or Star Wars or anything. What made you want to do a STEM subject? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, especially um, in line with the work that Claire's doing, which I think is so important. Um, basically, when I was in high school, um, I had an amazing woman physics teacher who just was fabulous. And I think if you speak to almost anyone, anyone in the world, right, you can always relate to the best teacher you had at school, and it almost always ends up being what you do in life. And for me, that was a Mrs. Hill shout out if she's listening. <laughs> I ended up doing physics because of her. Um, and, and in contrast to that, I thought about doing engineering, um, but then I went and did some work experience. And on the first day, this bloke said to me, oh, why do you want to be an engineer? You're a woman. You should be a nurse. <sighs> um, so you can imagine me, an impressionable 16-year-old, a bit intimidated. Obviously, I didn't go down that path, and I became a physicist instead, thanks to the amazing role models I had. What did you, what, what did you say to him? Unfortunately, I wasn't the kind of um, outspoken feminist that I am now, and I just kind of cowered <laughs> away. I wish, I'd, I wish I'd spoken back, but I didn't have the confidence, sadly, that I do now. Yeah, you should go home and be a dinosaur, mate, because that's where you belong. <laughs> um, is it about role models? Is it about seeing women like Claire, who are out there doing this, seeing women like you who are out there doing this, and having those inspirational teachers and lecturers to lift you up? It's definitely a big part of that. Um, it's also removing the barriers along the way. So obviously seeing yourself, knowing that there are people to help you, but it's also making it easier for people from underrepresented groups. So it's things like having dedicated funding for people who maybe come from a lower socioeconomic background. Um, things like obviously very well reported recently was the this, um, gender pay gap. Um, that's a really big problem in STEM. Um, across across the UK, really. So that's something we seriously need to address because if we're going to attract women and minorities into our field, well, we definitely ought to pay women the same as we're paying men, for sure. And, and men have got a role to play in this as well, Anya, in terms of um, in terms of making women feel welcome and valued and and colleagues in these fields. Yes, absolutely. And I I think that's a really big part of it is educating like everyone to make sure that our environments are welcoming, are accessible and inclusive just to everyone really and making it feel like it's a workplace that anyone who wants to can feel like they can join, making it feel like it's a field, you know, like you just said to me at the start there, what's cooler than looking for life on Mars? You say that to a five-year-old, they're going to be excited. So how are we going to change that to for, make it... For, for yeah. parents, maybe, and grandparents listening to this, we're in exam time at the moment, Anya, and if they're having those conversations with their children or grandchildren about what they want to be in life, what can they do to help on this journey as well? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a big part of it is just making sure that they understand that it's not about it. If people think of science as being really hard and you've got to be some kind of genius to do it. And it's absolutely not about that. You know, I'm, I'm definitely not a genius and I've, I've had, I just work hard and it, it's the same as anything. You know, if you're a footballer, you train all day. I just train in the lab. It's the exact same thing. It's not about being some kind of super clever person. If you're excited about it, if you're excited about Star Wars, there's no reason why you can't be excited about it as a scientist. Anya, great job this morning on this for us. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Real pleasure to speak to you. Anya O'Brien there, planetary science PhD student at the University of Glasgow, uh, proving exactly why STEM subjects are for everyone, 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 are for everyone. Are for everyone. <laughs>